so we have you should be able to see the module four you should now see module four on blackboard and what we're going to do is consider virtualization and concurrency together because basically basically if you consider process you know the running process memory management and threads as uh, OS methods and you consider the structure of the OS kernel that provides for that capability you can pretty much um, frame a review of virtualization and concurrency very efficiently. So if we look at um, our textbook, there's an awful lot of <laughs> There's an awful lot of uh, very meaty content that uh, revolves around the two primary topics. It, again, most operating system textbooks have a tendency to treat persistence last. And I'm going to give you a reason why I think persistence is better covered first in just a minute. but. In, in simplest of terms, and, and this is uh, this is something I'd so your your um, these are the last student learning objectives for our module four study guide, and we want you to understand how virtualization and concurrence concepts are interrelated, right? The meaning and importance, and in in, in the most simplest of terms. Everybody knows that an operating system, one of the things, one of the most important attributes or capacities of an operating system is this ability to multitask, right? I mean, would everyone agree to that statement? Yes. I mean, what's, what, what good is a machine? If you have a CPU, if you have RAM, if you have disk IO, if you have all those physical resources, and now you have an application that you can run, but you can only do one thing at a time. You can only run one application at a time. Uh, you know, the utility of computing systems is greatly reduced. And what we wanna do is start with this notion of multitasking, okay? So we wanna take a step back and look at it from 100,000 feet, and we don't want this to scare us okay we want a way we want a way to put this into context so we started with this idea of an operating system that boots into directories that load the you know the os kernel and then there's a there's a main boot sector or a, you know there's main primary file tables main file tables and um, that provides you with screens and data files and directories you can work with. But, but the, real, the real work is done uh, once you load stuff out of those files, right? And in the plainest terms, in order to multitask, you have to be able to gracefully juggle tasks. Gracefully juggling tasks is called concurrence, okay? And, and we, we did cover this in the first module, those are the basics. You know, an operating system has to be able to gracefully juggle tasks. But let's take it a step further. And I've rarely seen this addressed in plain terms like I'm about to share with you in any uh, undergraduate level textbook. But when you talk about Persistence concepts and methods. Let's let's focus now on concurrence. You're juggling tasks. So how do you juggle tasks, right? If you have 10 running applications, right? 
on your system, how is it your computer system is able to juggle those 10 applications on your, you know, on your screen gracefully? So how is it able to pull off concurrence? And the answer is virtualization. So let's give you an example. What do you do when you have 10 applications that each use the CPU? Virtualization says, or virtualization is a method where you provide 10 virtual instances of a CPU to each application. It's the same with RAM and disk IO, right? So what you're doing is, is you're creating multiple instances of virtual resources, the hardware components and the related system calls, right? So just in this simple example, if I have 10 applications that are running when I start up my operating system, it's the virtualization of the CPU, 10 virtual CPUs, 10 virtual sets of RAM modules, 10 sets of disk IO. That's what makes it possible. That's how concurrence can happen gracefully. When you start up an application and you boot up your operating system, it begins to spin up a whole series of multiple virtual resource sets. And by, by uh, multiple instances of virtual resources, remember I'm talking about hardware components and related system calls, all right? How many of you remember our days from computer architecture? And the idea that in device manager, the operating system is actually providing, actually providing a set of virtual devices. Like take this wireless card, for example. Uh, is the web browser the only thing that can use the wireless adapter at any given moment? with a properly functioning operating system? Hello? Yes. So do you think that, where did my, where did my, where did my screen go? I had, I had this up. If you look at a wireless card, and let's say that uh, you're multitasking and 10 of, of the 10 applications that are running when you start up your operating system, three of them have to do with the internet, okay? A web browser, an email application, and uh, OneDrive storage in the cloud. Everybody with me? Yeah. Okay. In computer architecture, we showed you that basically what happens with the system architecture components is that the operating system virtualizes them, right? And it's actually represented by an address range, a memory address range, an explicit chunk of memory. So what am I saying? I'm saying that for those three applications that need to use the wireless system component, right, for connectivity, web browsing, email, and OneDrive storage, right? Is everybody with me so far? You have this virtual notion, this virtualized wireless card. It's not the real physical wireless card, but it's a representation of the wireless card. And there's memory address ranges that are allocated in advance. And there's controls like this interrupt control here. And we'll talk more about controls in a minute. And so there could be uh, three breakouts of memory ranges, memory address ranges, a breakout of three, in the, for the example that I'm giving you, there could be three separate memory address ranges that represent virtually the wireless adapter, that wireless resource, okay? It's the, so we create, we create a virtual example of a wireless card and we have to have memory. Remember that a processor is gonna work on, you know, memory stores data. If you remember the von Neumann model, 
the von Neumann model of uh, architecture. And we went over that already, right? Didn't we do that in the first, first module? Yes, we did. Yes, so you, you have data and you have instructions. And the CPU basically fetches, decodes, and executes. So it fetches data, it fetches instructions, it decodes the instructions, and then it executes. And for those three applications, you have to have the virtual semblance or representation of a wireless component here. And all of this is happening in the background. So, so what are we saying? We're saying that in order to multitask, you have to be able to juggle tasks gracefully. That's called concurrence. In order for concurrence to occur properly, you have to be able to virtualize resources and system components. And in a simple example, if you had 10 applications running on your system after, after boot up, you'd have to have two virtual instances or 10 virtual instances of a CPU, some RAM address memory, the virtual devices that go with it, right? So you, you basically have to virtualize all of the, the hardware resources and the system calls, right? The related system calls. So you have to queue those up. And, and here's, here's where I want you to understand. So now you have these 10 sets of hard, virtual hardware components and then all of the related system calls and resources that are on hand. They're queued up and they're ready, right? These have to be coordinated, right? They have to be coordinated, they have to be scheduled. And uh, that means they're exchanged into and out of in real time into page memory, right? So page memory is virtual memory. It's virtual RAM. You run out of, you run out of system. Random access memory, non-volatile non memory is plentiful, but volatile system memory, the amount of space you have in RAM, it dies with power. It's uh, it's limited in size. You start juggling ten applications, and and you have to start paging into and out of memory, right? So you're you're taking huge chunks of of RAM and swapping them out for hard disk, and then you have to manage the scheduling and switching or paging, right? You have to manage that with locks with condition variables or CVs, right? Condition variables with semaphores. And in generic terms, the virtualization and concurrence, in general terms, and here's the part I want you to understand. So if you, if you get conceptually that we have these file system resources, we power things on, now they, now they, load, into, they load into action, right? You have all these things that are being juggled, this smooth interaction of uh, virtualization and concurrence requires what we call a process, a running process. So, so the whole idea of virtualization, which in turn is there for concurrence, it requires this, this uh, running process. And that smooth interaction of running processes demands effective memory management. And in cases where related processes must be designed to work together, the notion of parents and threads becomes essential. So why am I spending so much time investing in these two paragraphs? Why did I walk you through these words and highlight them and talk you through them? I want you to come back to the textbook. Just as we started at the end of the textbook, we wanted to have some solid notions about uh, file system resources and how those work in a proper operating system. I want you to see here, when we talk about virtualization, it's talking about process. Look at all of the chapters, right? Process, process API, direct execution, and then you have scheduling, right? That has to do with the controls of those processes. You have memory management. So now you have a memory API so you have a process API, application programming interface, right? You have memory management, which goes into the, you know, address, address range allocations, right? How do you provision address spaces? When you're translating, right? That has to do with swapping. Remember I talked about page file? 
paging, translation, page tables, and swapping. So you're, you're taking huge chunks of RAM address ranges. And as you're coordinating the running processes by scheduling and other controls, right? What's going to happen is that you have to swap these, these sets of data, the virtualized instances of resources and components, you're swapping them out in chunks as people are multitasking. And then let's talk about processes again. If, if some of those processes are designed to relate or interact with each other, then you have this idea of threads, right? So you can have a process that's, that's called multi-threaded, right? It's a multi-threaded process. I'm sure you've heard that before. So threads, the thread API, that's really kind of an extension of the process, process methods. When you have a process that is multifaceted and interactive, you often fold those processes together into a single running process and uh, you, work, you work this thread API. So, so, so if you have a multivaried process or a multifaceted process, now you're dealing with threads. And on that level, how do you work the controls and the coordinations? With locks, with conditional variables, with semaphores. And, and I thought that it would be really helpful for us, you know, how do you eat an elephant, right? Uh, we want to see how process memory and thread APIs, uh, what the essentials are for each of those and how they function. So we, so our purpose for this module is to review concepts related to the running process and the process API with uh, memory management, right? and the memory API and with threads. And you're talking about concurrency and you're talking about juggling and coordinating. Um, threads are what empower or provide the resources for more elegant multitasking. So when you're talking when you're talking about multitasking on steroids, you can't really do that without talking about threads. And 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 uh, again, threads is is like a parent child, a parent process with three or four child processes and ten grandchild processes. That's what multi-threading is. So this idea of threading is what makes takes concurrency to the next level. That's what. That's what allowed concurrency to be taken um, that much further in, in modern terms. I don't want you to freak out because we have all of these uh, chapters in the textbook that um, are subject for reference. I don't expect you to review all of those. I want you to pay specific attention to the stuff in this. I want you to use the study guide uh, as your basis for review. And um, if you see links, I want you to click on links, right? And I want you to spend some quality time in the next day or so to memorize those two, two paragraphs, okay? Because it, in layman's terms, if you're going to keep all this straight, if you're going to keep all this straight, you need context. And the context I'm attempting to uh, articulate here with you is this, this whole notion of a modern operating system. What does it really do for us? It multitasks. It allows us to do a number of tasks all the time. And that, so, so what am I doing really? <laughs> we started over here with persistence. And then we, we talk about this idea of multitasking and concurrency and how essential that is as a primary attribute and, and capability of an operating, a modern operating system, right? And, and what does that depend on? Virtualization. So I'm seriously thinking about writing my own textbook for operating system um, 
400 level operating system classes because I really think that the world is kind of bass backwards. I think they're really kind of um, backwards in terms of their approach to the concepts and that it's easier to grasp what's really happening. Now, I told you that it was important to understand file system stuff and that's typically covered later in the course around this time of the semester and people are scrambling to get their hands on it after they've learned about all this virtualization and concurrency. And then they have all sorts of problems managing this stuff because they've never gotten to the persistence. Here's what I mean by that. Um, let's take this just a step further. So I want, once again, I want you to memorize the previous two, memorize verbatim, wrote. In fact, I want you to be able to write it out on a sheet of paper. It's that important. Because what you see here is 20 years of system engineering experience. And I'm taking this and giving you the, hey, everything you needed to know about critical OS attributes and capabilities in a couple of sentences so that it makes sense, right? So let me show you the piece that has to do, remind me to show you the piece that has to do with the file system. And, and, and how to pull this all together in just a minute. But, but please, go over this and over this and over this. Memorize it, be able to write it out. The whole idea of multitasking depends on what? Concurrence. What does concurrence depend on? Virtualization of multiple instances. So I even give you a video to watch. And I want you to spend the time to watch this video. I know it's kind of corny. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. Can everybody hear this? This sentence is grammatically correct. Right now, it's time for our first performer. Can everybody hear this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So think of that analogy about the 10 applications that are running. So, you, so, so you, that you have a, an OS that's capable of multitasking in the first place. You have 10 multiple instances of virtualized resources hardware components and system calls, system uh, system API functions, right? For the evening, and ladies and gentlemen, the tradition of fabulous novelty action, such as plane spinning action we've had on our rainy gym, this young fellow is outstanding, and you're gonna really love it. All the way, ladies and gentlemen, from Denmark, let's really hear it for Henrik Bertal, right here in our city. Okay, so in terms of an analogy, he has a structure here. He's got these long poles, and this, okay, and this guy's from Denmark, and of course the U.S. Virgin Islands was for the longest time owned and uh, governed by, by Denmark, right? But uh, one of the things that I found so attractive about this analogy is this notion that you have these long spines, these long rods, wooden rods. And as he spins this up, he's setting in motion this oscillation. And the oscillation is feeding the spin of the plate so that it persists, it's persistent, right? And this notion that you have to have infrastructure and you have to have methods in place to spin up resources that are readily available that remain assist that remain available at a moment's notice of course he takes it out further and further and further now you see every now and then you'll catch him where he runs down the line and he shakes the pole again, right? So it's like a spring. He's shaking the pole, shaking the pole, shaking the pole. So there's inputs, right? And then this, this structure has an output. It starts to oscillate again, and it keeps, it keeps the plate spinning. The spin of the plate is what keeps it balanced. You don't have the capacity to juggle 10 different things unless you have balance and control and a constant input and a way to schedule. 
So he, he stops every now and then and he schedules his, his uh, refresh, right? He schedules, and that's an intentional word here. He schedules the refresh of the tension on the poles, the oscillation on the poles, and it, it goes on down the line, right? Okay, well, I know that I know that was uh, I know that may seem like a waste of time, but as a visual, I think it it really helps uh, stress the point here. So you have a process that's running, right? And the process is a queued up set of resources, right? So it spins up a set of memory address ranges and system calls, right, to store and process data. So that's what it's doing when you load an application. I mean, you have, we have applications that process a uh, programming statement one after another, and then it terminates and it ends, right? And so a lot of us are used to the idea that a software application is just going to run and then it's going to stop when it's finished and it's over with. But that's not really, that's not really what makes a modern operating system practical and functional. I mean, if we went back 50 years in time and the only thing we ever did was run one application through a series of tasks in a stepwise fashion and then it ended, and then we could only do one at a time, we'd be in the, we'd be in the ice age, right? We'd be way, way back. The thing that I want you to understand is that processes are called services in Windows, and they're called daemons or demons, and that's spelled D-A-E-M-O-N. And the file that runs that or the service, you can tell in Linux if something is associated with a service because the letter D is always on the end and it's pronounced separately. It's stated apart from the root word. So telnet D is how you would pronounce that, inet D, right? And uh, by the way, this is this draft of the study guide is out on module four now, and uh, everyone should see that. But I, I also wanted to take a moment here while I was in here, and you were familiar with this before in computer architecture, please say yes. Yes. Okay. And you get the idea that it's not just one instance of the wireless card that's made available to an application, but it's multiple instances across this entire memory range. You know, this is what's reserved by the operating system for use, but that's quite a chunk of memory and it's swapped in and out as other applications are using it, right? But here's the part I wanted to show you that brings it full circle, I believe. So here we have Windows Services. And this is in the Computer Management MMC, Microsoft Management Console. And right underneath Device Manager and Services, here's the part that I want you to see. So there are all these running services, right? All this multitasking going on, all of these processes that are loaded up. And what do I have going? Well, I have a browser, I have a Zoom, session that's in play. I'm also recording this session, so I'm writing screen images and audio to disk. Uh, what else do I have going on? Oh, oh yeah, I've got a Word document open. I've got a file, three different uh, uh, file explorer windows open because I'm juggling resources here. And each of those require a series of these uh, services. But Let's take a look at um, this on a larger scale. Can everyone see this column right here? Yes. So we have a process in Windows, it's called a service. So if I say service, you're gonna say, oh, that's a Windows OS process, right? 
And if I say service for Linux, you're going to scold me and say, no, that's a daemon, right? But this is the thing I want you to understand. When we were talking about file system resources, file system objects, right? I want you to understand that some of these, like RPC is huge. This has to do with the connectivity and files, extending file system resources across the network. So RPC has to do with um, the previous module. I made, met, I made reference to CIFS and RPC previously. So when you're sharing network services across a network, this is something that started automatically and it's logged on as a network service. But I'm gonna go into the properties here and I want you to see this a little more explicitly. So this running process has a set of options or attributes that are also part of that execution. And that's what keeps it running. That's what keeps the plate spinning. Are you with me? Here's the thing I want you to understand. There's a certain privilege or permission. Do privileges and permissions ring a bell by any chance? R back. Yeah, R back. Do you remember one of those was read, write, and what's the last one? The three primary permissions for most file systems, read, write, and? Modify? No. Execute? Execute, yes, give the man a cigar. Read, write, and execute. Now modify is another word for saying write, okay? Read, write, and execute, right? Why would that matter? Why would execute matter? Well, when it comes to services, we have user accounts and user groups that we uh, spend time working on, but there are also system accounts. In fact, there is an account called system. And there is an account that has to do with network activity and it's called the network service account. And what am I saying? I'm saying that sometimes when you're developing, let's say that you're developing software that you want to load and you want it to remain available and you want it to be running in the system tray, right? So, you know, you took all these programming courses and then you come up with a great app and you want to sell it on Android. You want to sell it on Android. You want to sell it on iPhones. So you want to offer it through Google Play and through the, the uh, App Store. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Okay. And when people have that loaded on their phone, you want that application to be queued up. You want it to be running as a service or as a daemon in Android, right? or on the iPhone, you, you want it to be running active because, uh, I mean, how many of you have notifications enabled on your stuff? Does anybody here have notifications enabled for Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or Snapchat, right? Yes. Yeah. So here's a question. How would you get a beep or a screen splash if something wasn't running in the background, right? You have a service, you have a process for that application that's watching, it's sitting lying in wait. It's a spinning plate waiting for an action to happen. And you have to give it some authority to load. It has to execute. It has to have the execute privilege. More importantly, it can't just run and stop. It can't just end. It has to load up a set of memory address allocations and system components, virtualized components and system controls or calls, right? Functions, system functionality. And uh, you have to have that permission to do it. So the executable permission is associated with a security principle. The thing that I want you to understand is that there are services as you design software to, to run continuously and to be multitasking, multi-threading, it's going to have to execute. 
you're going to have to give it some level of authority or permission to execute. And if you can't use system or you can't use network, you can create a custom account. You, so you see this account is specified, it's network service. But I could, now well, let's see, is software protection a good one to try for this? Uh, it's a network service again. So, um, you can create a special account that's created when you load the software. So when you install the software, the software creates a security principle called um, my pop-up. I'm just going to use the, I'm going to use the, the Android and iPhone app as an example, where there's a notification method or, or feature built in, right? And, and you're going to call it um, my app notice. Uh, you're going to call the account my app notice or something like that, right? So what am I saying? The part of the installation process of your software is to create a security principle, a, a system account, not a user account. And then as the system is installed, your software is intelligent enough to know, hey, I want to use this account to run this service and here's the password and the confirmed password. Now, this is where it gets really fun. Can everybody see this account password and confirmed password? Yeah, we can see. Okay. You know that 10 years ago when hackers were eating everybody's lunch, we started coming up with this crazy idea that every 30 days we had to change our password or every 90 days we had to change our password. Yeah. Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Okay. So let's say you set up some software to stay running and you're going to use its own security account to load it with a certain set of permissions because why? Because if a straight user or a guest account tries to load and use your software, it doesn't work. And then everybody says your software sucks because it doesn't work with half the people that have login accounts because they just have straight user accounts. They don't have administrative accounts. Okay. Are you with me so far? So, so let's pretend that you want any kind of person who uses the device to be able to use a service that's part of an application, like a notification service, it's part of the application, even if they have a standard user account, they don't have an administrator account. And in order to make that happen, you're going to enable this by creating a system account with a special name. It's going to install with your software. You're going to have a password for it. And when the, when the executable loads and stays running, it's going to be running with executable permissions based on that account. So instead of seeing network service here, you're going to say my app notice instead, right? So let's pretend that we have the my app notice account. 30 days from now, your operating system says, hey, your passwords are old. You have to change this. Guess what happens? half the time when you're using, ironically, you're using a special account to ensure that the process and the service will stay running so that it's more reliable. And it's the system security policies that rear its ugly head and say, okay, it's been 30, 30 days are up, you have to change the password. Question. How many of you would like to manually change the password on all the software apps that were installed and all the thousands of users that you sold when your app went viral? Do you understand the question? No. Can you repeat that? Let's pretend that you went to the extra trouble to create a security principle, a special security account, that's a system account, not a user account. It loads with your software. Your software, you want your software to be more reliable. And you want, you want the service to run, not because a user with standard privileges started the service, but because your system account started it. Put another way, you want your service to keep running, no matter which user is on the screen. 
Does everybody know what happens if I have all these apps running right now and I sign out? What happens to all of the open apps that I have right now if I sign out? Do they stay running in the background? Or do they all close and exit? They're still running. No, they aren't. Oh. <laughs> they aren't. Computer management closes. My, win my file explorer windows close. My browser closes. My Word document. All of it's shut off when I sign out. See, now I did this manually. I'm using all these resources. But if, but if you want to provide a service, right? If you want to provide an application that's always running, it's always instant on, it's multitasking, right? Or it has instant notification. It has to be watching and running in the background. So you go to the trouble to create a separate system account that's used to start the service and it has executable permissions. The service is running because the special account has executable permissions to execute your service, to start your process and your service running. All right, are you with me? There's a password on that account. In 30 days, it expires. Do you think that's going to help your service run more efficiently every time the password has to be changed? The short answer is no. Um, so why am I sharing this with you? Uh, one of the things I want you to understand about Windows services is that you can run them with a designated security a system account instead of a user account. So it stays running all the time. So no matter which users are changing or logging out or logging in, your software doesn't skip a beat. Okay. Can you think of scenarios where that kind of functionality is important? Well, I can think of hospitals. Would you like your... Um, your IV pump to stop working because the nurse signed out of the shift? No. No. Right? Would you want your car to quit working because some other driver's in it? Right? I mean, just think about, think about the practicality of this, right? If you have a service that you want to stay running, how do you ensure that it's running? Do you tie the execution of that service, the execution of that process to a user account? No, you don't want to do that. You want to tie it to a service account, except that the local system account and the network service account each have restrictions and specific criteria you have to observe. If you have custom software, you may not want to use the local system account or the network service account because it's multitasking and multi-threading and it may behave differently or worse when it's multitasking and juggling running applications. You may want to create your own user account. The important thing that I want you to understand is these are all file system objects which require permissions, executable permissions. And how do you ensure that it's going to be running? Well, you have a system account that you create, a dedicated custom system account. Then you, you structure the service to run with that account. So you, you could say log in as local system account. You could change that. And you could say, okay, I want users to be able to interact with that on the desktop. But that may not be a good situation depending on the function of your software. So, so a lot of services use this feature. And it's a separate security account, a system security account that's used. And that system security account has a password. Well, if the password has to change, what you really need to do is create a system account using something called a managed service account. I'm going to see if this is in here. Uh, it's, all right, so this the draft isn't comp complete yet, but um, before we finalize the final revision of the of the study guide, we're going to be talking about the managed service account. So the managed service account allows you to designate a special account, a system account, and you create that like you would a user account, except, except you, you change the type of account that it is to a managed service account. 
And if you have groups of processes that have to run together, there's actually a group managed service account. What's special about the service account is that the password automatically changes on intervals so that the password expiration is not a problem. This is hugely important for you if you develop solutions for Windows. And 90% of the screens in, in the world that are running are running Windows. And if you're a computer science student that's looking for a job when you finish your degree, you want your stuff to run and keep running and not have, you don't want calls a month later and people are saying, well, it was working fine and now that everybody's using it, it stopped. Right? Everybody hear me? So, yes. so I want you to be aware of this idea about the executable permissions and the idea that you can create special system accounts and those can be of a type where it's called a managed service account. It creates its own complex password encrypted, but within the time interval that's required, it refreshes a new password so it never expires. So it controls the service, it keeps the service running, and it locks down the service. Now, put another way, what are we saying? Some services have privilege, right? They keep running no matter what. In a sense, it's a privileged service. It's a dedicated service. I wanna help you understand that on a, on a deeper level yet. Um, so the first thing I want you to do when we finish our session today is I want you to pick up a copy of the draft for the study guide. I want you to start reading it and I want you to memorize which part of the study guide. Please don't make me cry. The first two paragraphs of the first section. I want you to memorize this, right? And go ahead and read the rest of this, right? So it talks about, you know, taking into account the acronym for CPU. It's a central what? Processing unit. What do we do? We load processes that have data and instructions. They fetch, decode, and execute, right? But here's the piece that I want you to understand before you get into the weeds, because if you don't know some of those essentials before you get into the weeds, you have no way to interpret, you have no way to interpret the diagrams. We were just talking about how some services can maintain permissions to execute even if passwords change, even if users log in and log out, right? So one of the things I want you to understand is that there are services that tie to the physical hardware. Those are called low level services or low level components, OS components, right? The ones that are interactive with applications are considered high level components. And in terms of the operating system kernel or internals, the deeper you go, the closer you get to the kernel and the more privileged a service runs, the, the more you're talking about a service that runs in supervisor mode. So, so one of the extensions of understanding operating system internals so the brains and the heart of the operating system is this idea that it's able to distinguish what has greater priority and direct access to physical resources versus which services do not have priority and do not have direct access. They have to have indirect access, right? In Windows, the mechanism that allows for this distinction with respect to hardware privilege and, and what I'm going to tell you is that historically people write software that crash systems when they, when they don't, when applications don't play nice with others, oftentimes it's because of the way it lays hold of the physical hardware and it doesn't share the physical, it doesn't play nice with others because it doesn't share the resources well with others. Put another way, it doesn't comply with the conventions for HAL, the hardware abstraction layer is a low level component it's part of the it's part of the infrastructure or structure of an operating system 
and I I could spend another hour showing you elegant pictures of the skeletal systems of different animals and saying, see, isn't there a relationship between the structure of that um, fin on the fish and its function to propel through the water, right? In nature, you see this relationship all the time. There is a structure that correlates or is there to provide for a given function. The function depends upon the structure. Put another way, the function is not possible un unless there's a structure there. And part of, the part of the idea of multitasking gracefully means you have to control access to hardware because you're creating virtual multiples. And if somebody latches on to the hardware in a manner that's not pleasant. Um, so, so the inside, the internals of the operating system have two different modes of operating, user mode and kernel mode. I want you to understand that's a convention and a way of framing uh, the, the execution of a running service. If a running service is executed with supervisor ring zero privileges, so, so, so we differentiate further between just executing a service and exe executing it with priority, right? So if it's associated with hardware inside Windows, they have a whole section of the OS internals called the HAL, hardware extraction layer. And I want to show this to you very quickly. Um, nope. Here, here. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Okay. So here we have a diagram of the Windows, the internal structure of the Windows operating system. Can everybody see? Hardware extraction layer. Yes, we can see. Okay. Can everybody see kernel mode and user mode? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So one of the things I want to cement firmly in your minds is this idea that you have privileges to execute, but it's important to understand there's different levels of privilege, just like the file system, right? we talk about file system, you have administrator privileges. You can do anything, right? You have all, all privileges and you have all permissions. In terms of running services, if you have a service that's running in the kernel mode, it has privileged access to the deepest resources in the heart of the kernel of the operating system. And that includes the hardware. So the most vulnerable, the most sensitive, and the highest level of security requirements basically occur uh, closest to hardware, actual physical hardware, right? And what I want you to understand is that when you, when you run a service with executable privileges, you can run it in kernel mode or in user mode and, and uh, kernel mode means it's going to have priority over system resources and hardware more than others. Put another way, somebody else's ill-behaved application will not be able to destabilize the operating system. Somebody who poorly codes an application is not going to be able to crash your whole system. So there are services that are considered mission critical because they keep the operating system spinning and running. And if that stops, then everything crashes. So you have this higher level of service that's run with ring zero or kernel mode, and it's more deeply embedded, so embedded, it's the closest thing you can get to the physical hardware. Does, does that make sense? Yes. And then the, and the further away from that you get to where the user applications are, those are user mode services, right? So running applications that aren't, you have operation system, you have operating system services that uh, the app, all applications need, and those run with greater privilege. And that makes sense because if you can't 
if you can't can't work memory and CPU calls, then you're in trouble. But the applications themselves are out here and the services that load out here are typically less privileged. And that's why they have to cooperate by design. This structure has to do with the function. This structure has to do with the function. You have kernel mode uh, in the heart of the operating system for a reason. That's because when you're spinning up applications that do not terminate, that stay running, some need to be privileged because they provide resources for everything and everyone. And if they go wonky and unstable, then the whole thing crashes. The other ones have to do with user applications that multi, you know, people juggle, they multitask. Okay, that's all we're going to cover for now. Uh, please get started with uh, your review of the study guide. Does anybody have any quick questions before we clear? No, I don't have no question. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and and uh, stop the recording then.